You know, when you're ultimately in a battle, you got to study your opponent. And frankly, for 10 years, the labels were my opponent and my friends. It was a very dysfunctional dynamic. Right. I had hair like Fabio before I started this, basically. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Inner Sleeve on the Watch Mojo Podcast Network. I'm your host, Cassius Morris, and today we have a very special episode. As you can see, we're joined by a special guest from Montreal, Canada, the founder and CEO of Watch Mojo, Ashkan Karbastrishan. How are you, sir? Very good, yourself. You don't have to call me, sir. How are you, man? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. I, I really appreciate you hopping on this show with me to give people an understanding of where Watch Mojo is currently going uh, with the brand and the content. So I guess the first thing I should ask you is, podcasts have been around for quite a long time. Of course, music and these topics have been being tackled by Watch Mojo. Why podcasts and why now? You know, on any given day, I get about five to 10 ideas from colleagues, fans, uh, prospective partners. And, you know, most of them are good. And if they're bad ideas, it's usually a matter of timing. So... I think podcasts are, along with just audio, including music, just undergoing a boom. And I think it's largely starts with, obviously, the internet and mobile devices uh, and pre-pandemic people kind of commuting and, you know, just being able to have 247 connectivity. Right. Um, you know, the, the biggest takeaway for, for us, though, is 15 years ago when we launched the company, uh, we didn't have like a plan B. You know, it wasn't like we were writing articles like, you know, media who were publishing text content. So we dove in and we kind of burned the boat, so to speak, to make sure that we could tell stories through video. And because we didn't have like articles, we had no choice. We had to nail videos and make sure our videos were really uh, good to watch. So I think for us, we always kind of felt like, well, look, we're, we're, covering the people and places and things that fans are passionate about. You know, we didn't have articles. We dove straight into videos, which was like the third version of storytelling. And we never really had audio only. So mm. whereas if you are like Rolling Stone magazine, it's actually probably easier for you to branch out into podcasts than to also think of that third dynamic, which is sight, sound, you know, motion and all that. Right. So we, we never felt like compelled to get into podcasts because we read an article or we saw a deal. Um, but I think that the reality is because over the last couple of years, we admittedly have reduced how much music content we produce to really focus more on movies, TV shows and gaming. I just felt like, you know, we had a lot of passionate people like yourself who were approaching us or we were talking to. And we just felt like, you know what? It's not about reinventing Watch Mojo as a podcast. That will be really hard to do because we always create these mental blocks as humans of like, oh, maybe we can't do this. Maybe we won't be good enough. Resistance. We, exactly. We, we create resistance in our own head. And yeah. so for us, it just made more sense to say, you know what? If we're known for movies, TV shows, and gaming, but we have this pedigree where we covered all the essential artists. We did biographies and profiles. We did top 10 lists. We have interviews, you know, with, with so many musicians that for us, it just was a bit of a natural to say, you know what, let's take sports and music where we have a big ca back catalog, but admittedly we don't do that much relative to movies and TV shows. Mm -hmm. Let's go find people who are good storytellers in audio format. We could really engage an audience and let's see how we could kind of like re-engineer ourselves and you know reinvent ourselves to just go out and reach a whole new audience so that's kind of how it all came to be and that's what brings us here that makes a lot of sense and i, I like the concept that it's not a reinvention of watch mojo through a podcast it's simply adding to what you guys put out adding to the content output which is always important and so in, in what sense is it going to be a watch mojo or let me rephrase that What's going to make this a Watch Mojo style podcast? What's going to set us apart on the network um, from other styles of shows? Sure. Great, great, fair question. Even when we ventured into doing top tens, like really double down on that, because we used to do it all, right? We used to do how to's, we used to do mm -hmm. like tips. Travel. Obviously, we did a lot of interviews, we did a lot of biographies. But before we even settled down to focus on lists, because that's what our fans wanted, I always said, like, how are we going to be different? You know, I joke, you had Letterman, you had Wayne's World, you had Moses and his Ten Commandments. So for us, it was like, okay, 
you know, I really growing up being such a big music fan and sports fan, um, I kind of was writing biographies of, you know, whether it's Ozzy Osbourne or the Beatles, um, in excess, Duran Duran, Def Leppard, you know, Biggie Smalls, whoever, like I was always very much interested in successful people. That was really, I think at the core, you know, I've always been more about the underdog and the outsider. I had, so I loved talking about how like Ozzy Osbourne, you know, obviously had a lot of demons to fight. He got kicked out of Black Sabbath. He then came back stronger, obviously found, you know, a great fan and partner in, in Sharon who trusted him. And then he was very fortunate to come across Randy Rhodes. But that comeback story is what actually, aside from the awesome music, was what I liked. I like that story of overcoming the odds. So growing up when I was kind of doing, okay, I like biographies and I was writing articles and then we were doing the, the biographies and then when we did the top 10 list, I was like, we got to elevate, we got to do something more. You know, so our top 10 lists weren't just me talking about Ozzy Osbourne. I was like, you know what? We're going to go and we're going to play Diary of a Madman. We're going to play excerpts of Crazy Train. We're going to talk about The Ultimate City. We're going to talk about Zach Wilde and talk about Randy and J.K. Lee. And I really wanted to show. Um, and the reason why we were doing that is because we kind of had relationships with the labels, right? I mean, the labels, we go back, way back, you know, Sony, when it was Sony and BMG were one, they wanted us to be their local video team. You know, I joke when we're not in a pandemic mode, Warner Brothers would send us beta tapes that I keep in my office. And I go, well, how do you think I got this? I didn't go all <laughs> Tom Cruise Mission Impossible style to kind of steal this from their office. I'm like, they gave it to us, you know. Right. Uh, UMG, UMG would ask us to interview up and comers like Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber. So we had relationships, but I also knew enough, even though I'm not a lawyer, I knew enough about copyright and fair use that I said, you know what, just because others are afraid or don't know the law and they get easily intimidated by frivolous letters, uh, we're like, look, we're allowed to play a riff when we're talking about said riff. And if I'm comparing Zach Wild playing Crazy Train with Randy playing Crazy Train, we're allowed to play excerpts of that. Right. So the way we, we kind of pulled up a chair at the table and elevated the game was by actually showing you clips, which today you could take for granted. And, you know, we may be the unknown scrappy startup still, but we obviously played a part on the, 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 the new media landscape, especially with YouTube to kind of fight the fight for fair use established best practices. And then we made the decision to de-emphasize music because we, we wanted to serve our fans who wanted more movies and gaming. But similarly now, if you fast forward to today, I told my team, I'm like, we don't need yet another person, myself, you, anybody, just talking about the same thing. I said, however, you know what? We do have this pedigree. We did, you know, hundreds of bios and hundreds, thousands of top 10 lists. So I said, when stuff comes up in the news, like tragically when uh, Eddie Van Halen passed away, you know, we kind of wrestled with that. We said, well, you know, we've done the biography of, sorry, the profile of Van Halen, the band. Yeah. We've talked about Eddie Van Halen in greatest guitar riffs and solos and instrumentals. You know, we've done the top 10 Van Halen songs. So to just do a random Eddie Van Halen biography may seem random because now we're so known for movies and top 10 lists on games and TV shows on the core watch module channel on YouTube. Right. But I said, well, this is kind of our calling. Why wouldn't we start um, also in sports, but also now we're talking more about music on inner sleeve. I said, why don't we talk about, we pick an artist depending on something that happens that week, hopefully not tragic. It could be like 30 years ago, black Sabbath releases an album. And then we kind of dive in using our old list as a bit of a sounding board. And I'm not here to just talk about our list. Who cares about that? But as a jumping off point, you could point right. to something, extract something, and then bring on guests. And then if they're uh, you know, a musician who played with that artist, they can give us their you know, perspectives. If they're a new artist who was inspired and influenced by that, they could talk about it. And ultimately... Mm -hmm you know, just kind of like say, okay, we started off in music. We then made a decision to move away. And it was a decision, frankly, that was, you know, it's the paradox is we have great relationships with the labels, but we also obviously on YouTube had a lot of friction with them over the years. Yeah. And so for me, this was more of like, you know, going up on a mountain, sitting there meditating, so to speak, and saying, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to repeat what we did. We fought that fight. We won, so to speak. We serve fans. We have all these biographies that are still there. 
But in terms of just like evolution, I said, there are these stories that we want to tell. And maybe if we kind of like tap into our DNA, but then maybe kind of like let, you know, the story take us wherever it makes sense, Mm. then I think we could add a lot to the landscape and help new fans familiarize themselves with classics, but also then introduce older fans to new artists. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, you see that on, you know, nowadays, especially with YouTube, when Ozzy and Post Malone do a duo, I'm pretty sure that Ozzy fans are like, who's this Post Malone guy? And Post Malone guys are like, why is Post singing with his grandpa? And then they go (laughs) and find out who Ozzy is, right? So it makes sense in my head, but that's why I was like, well, if we're going to go down this path with Inner Sleeve, where we kind of either something happens as news or there's like, you know, just a new release. Maybe we could kind of use our old catalog as a jumping point to then go and discuss whatever our hearts want to. But then I was like, okay, well, maybe we could have this first chat to kind of talk a little bit about our background, our origins, and, you know, yeah. where we want to make this. And fused with interviews and fused with so many different types of things. And I mean, the, the idea of having the, the list be a jumping off point is great because you're right. And, you know, as somebody who's running a company, you need to know what people are looking for. And for someone to just hear a breakdown of a of a breakdown, essentially, is not, I think, what people are really hungry for here. And um, you mentioned the copyright battles. You know, that's been something that people are very familiar with if they've delved into Watch Mojo, if they've delved into your work. How is this, Ash, going to present, if any, new copyright uh, battles, I guess, or struggles with YouTube, being that something like Inner Sleeve is a music podcast, you're doing bios that you'd potentially want to use clips. Are there any new struggles with copyright? I mean, now you're going to be basically serving as my shrink, right? The reality (laughs) is there's so many layers to this. The first one is you got to go back to the trauma and shock that the recording industry experienced when Napster came on the scene. Mm. At the time, Universal's boss, Doug Morris, went on at Sony eventually, or he may still be at Sony. He once said, look, technology was like asking me to operate like on a dog. It's not my forte, (laughs) which I actually think is a kind of crazy sounding statement, but I kind of get where Mr. Morris was coming from. Um, It was a new field, right? And it's like the genie was out of the bag. And I think with Napster, they were so defensive and they were so, you know, ill-prepared. And it was a different generation of decision makers that you can kind of give them a pass. But what happened with Napster is like, that was obviously, you know, decentralized P2P led to Kazaa, the guys who built Skype. And, you know, uh, the bottom line I'm getting to is fundamentally, the record labels went through about a decade where they had to cut, cut, cut. And they saw their revenues erode. And you got to sympathize with that. You got to put yourself in people's shoes. And True. record labels ultimately, a very, very influential person in the history of media and music called people who work for the record labels, like not the people in marketing, the, the, the day to day. We're talking about, you know, the, the, the head decision makers who decide who to sue and stuff like right. that, or deals that they sign with radio, CEOs, uh, CROs. Yeah, and, and this basically, this very influential, popular person called them like the worst people on earth, which I was like, okay, it's a bit harsh, but I understand that friction that has nothing to do with us between artists and, and record labels, which is another fight. That's not our fight to fight. Right. But I actually always understood the labels. I was like, look, the labels are ultimately spending tens, hundreds of millions of dollars developing talent, taking the risk. For they sure. want to protect their investment. So I always, I always actually understand the rights holder far more. Like I'm not this militant anti-establishment guy. I just always balance it. Mm-hmm. And so one is you got to understand like the counterparty, they're thinking, you know, when you're ultimately in a battle, you got to study your opponent. And frankly, for 10 years, the labels were my opponent and my friends. It was a very dysfunctional dynamic. Right. I had hair like Fabio before I started this basically. <laughs> but so they're coming from there. And then you see with the internet growing and audiences gravitating towards the web, you see the rise of Pandora and Spotify, where the labels are on the outside going, well, wait a minute, even if we collect 70% of every dollar that generates from streaming, we're on the outside. Those are not our users. You know, that's not our share price. Very true. So, So at 
when YouTube launched in 2006, YouTube was just the latest in many that wanted to kind of disrupt things. And then YouTube was kind of the pariah. You know, YouTube was like being sued by Viacom um, and, and was a bit of an afterthought. A few things happened where everything changed. I would say that sometime around, you know, you always had music. I would say sometime when YouTube went from pariah to bell of the ball is one when they launched Content ID. Content ID is like a weapon of mass destruction. It could be yeah. for not good, but it could be used like nuclear weapons for like certain purposes. But in the wrong hands, it becomes like nuclear energy. It could become a weapon of mass destruction and just blow shit up. So Content ID was actually technology that went above and beyond what the law allowed. The law is pretty simple. The law says, I have to come and demonstrate in a court of law that you are infringing on my copyright. That's like step one. Okay. Then I, if I prove that you are infringing on my copyright, then the judge will decide if there are damages. Mm -hmm. So that's the normal way to approach things if you go with the law. What Content ID effectively did, because YouTube was being sued by rights holders, is it kind of inverted that. It said, you're actually guilty. I'm assuming that you're infringing, but instead of suing you, I'm just going to basically take your revenue and take credit for your views, which is not, you don't call things that affect corporations constitutional or anti-constitutional. Right. They took out the middleman, aka the law. They basically go, I am judge and jury, which doesn't make sense. So <clears throat> when, when, when Content ID came on the scene, I think at first a lot of rights holders were like ignoring it. But then once they realized how powerful it was and how they could basically claim viewership data, viewership credit, revenue, without having to go demonstrate copyright infringement and ergo encroaching on our rights as a storyteller, as a media to rely on fair use, right? then naturally labels who others have called the worst people on earth were obviously going to just call shotgun and seize it all. Yeah. Another chapter is with Google Preferred. With Google Preferred, YouTube and Google managed to convince brands, marketers, to spend a lot of money to get access to younger audiences who are on YouTube. What Google Preferred did is it made YouTube ground zero for video advertising, which is proven to be very lucrative, right? I mean, you, yeah. you, you don't watch TV as much as you used to. You watch videos on YouTube and Netflix and all that. So, totally. So, so yeah, the background was nobody gave a damn about YouTube. We used to be induced in a legal sense from Universal, Warner, BMG, Sony to produce these biographies and interviews and eventually top tens as a promotional tool. And, you know, those thousands of emails where they basically said, yeah, you know, Watch Mojo helps us. It does not hurt us, let alone cause our IP immaterial damages. Um, but so once Content ID and Google came on the scene, as much as we had good relationships with the rights holders, then there were others who were maybe more in charge of revenue who were right. and rights who were maybe a bit more aggressive and they were effectively bypassing the law. So, from 2012, when we really doubled down on clip-based, relying on fair use, doing countdowns, from until about 2017, a day did not go by where I wasn't fighting like a gladiator, going and, you know, putting down a threat by Universal, and then turning around on my horse and going and like throwing, <laughs> like, you know, fire in like... Everybody's so getting it. <laughs> oh, but I was like, you had to act a bit crazy, but relying on the law to tell people, don't mess with us. Now... We still, I would say, one is relationships, which you had. The other one is understanding the law. The third pillar is common sense, where you want to always navigate and be diplomatic, but just... So I think fundamentally, it wasn't that the labels never came after us because they were like, oh, we like Ash. We like his rugged good looks. I think there were a lot of people internally that were like, guys, this is crazy. This is free promo. But I also think that they knew. They're like, we have sent thousands of emails over the years asking WatchMojo to do this stuff. How do we show up to court with or without dirty hands and now say that we're harming them? So right. in 2018, I just got to a point, <clears throat> sorry, maybe I just turned 40 then, 
where I went up to Sir Lucian Grange at Universal, all of the chairmen, all of the CEOs, and I said, look, we now have this group of rights holders, movie studios, TV networks, gaming publishers. They like us. Heck, they are even advertising with us. Some of them license our content to put on their platforms. We then come over here to the labels. You guys are dysfunctional. It was such a diplomatic note. It was almost like I was on drugs, you know, to, to sedate you. Right? <laughs> like a medicated note. <laughs> no, it was like a medicated version of that. You know, I was like, look, I was basically saying, I'm putting my sword down. I fought this. I have played my part to help you to reflect the law. And I published these articles where I basically, you know, redacted things that maybe are a bit more confidential, but I've kind of pointed to tell people like, look, like we were behind the scenes kind of encourage YouTube to follow the law and not just what they wanted. And the irony of YouTube is that YouTube built its business around the four safe harbors of the DMCA and telecommunications act. And I was basically saying, I like to just don't want any favors, but I'm allowed to build a business around the four tests of fair use and fair use right. is an exemption to copyright. So why do you get the safe harbor protection, but I can't have the exemptions from fair use. But in any case, um, in 2018, I was maybe a bit burnt out. And frankly, I was a bit tired of having like these rights holders who loved us versus the, the, these others at the music labels that were still occasionally like jamming sticks in our wheels, if not other places. And so I went to them and I said, look, you guys need to get your act together. But if you don't welcome this, I'm putting my sword down. I'm not going to fight you anymore. I'm just going to go take my ball and go play with the movie studios and the rights work. I was like, this is the latest example of people thinking Ash is crazy. Good luck with that pal. And then, you know, eventually coming around and to my own surprise, 2019 was a year of a lot of slow back and forth dance moves with the labels. Okay. One by one, they came back and they were like, at the same time, we like watch Mojo. Times have changed. We don't view YouTube as the enemy. They never would admit like fair use is your God given right or whatever, but they're like, we understand that, you know, your editorial is something we don't want to turn our backs to. Yeah. But the reverse psychology worked to some extent. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we were still getting the odd claims or the odd strikes, which we would navigate. And I've always said that is like some junior department or some outsourced shop that manages right. that for them. Still from companies that had given you the green light, that you'll sometimes get a get a claim? Oh, absolutely. All the okay. time. Because but it's that's at a lower level. Yeah, yeah. And earlier on, yeah. I would be like, Shelly, talk to Bob. You guys are not on the same page. You know, get your right. act together, then come see me united and and we could chat but i don't have the schizophrenic conversation where you're telling me more you're saying no mass no mass it doesn't right make sense. yeah no but so 2019 was like a weird year in that by and large we walked away a lot of the execs came back wanting to engage in some kind of partnership we still had like i said departments or people or agencies on behalf of these labels giving us a hard time so i did two things that were you know, more out of fatigue and running out of like, not options, but just running out of like ideas of like, this is too schizo. So I went and I basically told BMG, you know, in diplomatic, but pretty kind of like assertive, you know, methods. And I produced videos about this that, you know, their position legally did not make sense. But more importantly, because BMG is part of Bertelsmann and Bertelsmann has investments in our direct and indirect competitors, that it wasn't a good look for them to be using content ID copyright tools, not to protect their IP, which they would first have to go to court and prove were <laughs> on. But they're effectively, I said, we could give you facts and present evidence that you are effectively using these tools as anti-competitive means. Mm. And I said, the EU wow. does not like that. I said, you guys are Bertelsmann, like you are Germany, you know, Inc. Like you're, you're widely respected. You have fantastic brands. I know surely you, you're, you're not doing this on purpose, wink, wink, right? right. But I, this is called going to court with dirty hands. If you do this, if you don't step off, 
you know, it's like that scene where like the guy breaks the bottle of vodka at the bar and you're like, you don't know where things are going to go, but you don't, you don't want it to go there. Right. Let, let's stop it right is. here. <laughs> exactly. You know, I was like, please. And so look, whether they were like, who is this crazy person or, oh my God, you know, even if we, we did not mean to do this, this does look bad. So BMG kind of cooled down and I went back to them. I said, you know, thank you for just stepping off. If you want to partner with us, let's partner. But just don't come accusing me of wrongdoing when we have not done it. Yeah. They came and we chatted with them. And frankly, March 12th was when the pandemic shut things down. That was my birthday. March 15th, we had a call with them this year. And then we just said, look, let's just go. The world may be melting. Let's revisit this. So let's right. park that. Okay. Warner Music was a bit different. Warner Music, I literally was tired of them having some more junior employees still abusing content ID to them still asking us for marketing exposure, emails galore. Like we had thousands of emails, but also uh, certain people at Warner inquiring about investing or acquiring Watch Mojo. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Things that make you go, hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so, literally. Yeah. So one night, you know, as much as I love music, I'm a pretty decent soccer player, pretty good striker. It was good for, you know, anger management and, and stress release. I came back one night where I was just tired. I was like, it was Friday. My daughter, I picked her up. She was nine at the time. She was showing us the art that she had done that week at summer school. And I couldn't focus because I had to answer frivolous, meritless attacks. So I said, okay, it's on. That night, I went straight to the CEO. I emailed the CEO and I just put all the evidence. I was like, this is your like 15 years you're asking for. These are the claims, clearly frivolous, meritless. These are the facts. These are your executives that want to market with us. So like already damages, poof, gone. Finally, your executives. I'm not doing anything funny. I've been pretty transparent. Your other executives want to invest or buy Watch Mojo. I'm like, if you got, and I'm still very respectful, but there's a way you can right. be respectful and kind of be like- You got to be firm. You got to be firm. I press send. I go shower after my soccer match and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> what I just do. <laughs> yeah. And you know, they could be like, okay, Skippy, just for fun, we're going to sue you. I knew I would win at the merits, but you still don't want to pick a fight for no reason. Right. And I kind of let it go. And then like a few days later, you know, they came back to us and uh, actually it's not true. Uh, weeks later, I still followed up and you know, their, their, their counsel kind of very diplomatically and, and, and did the right thing and said, you know what? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, without admitting any wrongdoing, like we'll basically you know, not try to torpedo you guys. We'll concede, but we won't admit we're wrong. Yeah, and I'm not here to <laughs> look. It's I. I started off saying I respect their position in principle. Right. Like I'm right. not here to be a, a, a like an anarchist or anything. But like to me, you know, I, I don't want to pretend to wave the poor me. But like you know, I was born in Iran. I grew up in Canada. But I do take freedoms really seriously, like freedom of press, freedom of expression. Definitely. Freedom to go and, and congregate and just be able to say what you want. So to me, fair use was never that I needed to do top 10 Ozzy Osbourne, although I love doing that. It was just expression. It was media. You want to call people out and, and all that. And I'm always for the underdog. And so for me, when I saw YouTube, supposedly this democratic platform kind of not necessarily reflect the law, yeah, as a competitive person, I was like, I'll show them. I'm like, they're, they're wrong. And I will prove it, not through whining, but just through maybe a bit of whining as well. But like, firm arguments, you know? And so, so what happened was by and large, we finished like 2019 with a earnest attempt to come and sit down at a table and see if we could partner with them. And the same thing to some extent with Universal. Universal, I know like when Sir Lucian Grange got COVID, I sent him a note, which I'm sure he did not. He's probably busy with, you know, recovery. But the point was, you know, I've always tried to be, show them that, look, I'm an honest person, we're hardworking, we mean well, we're not anarchists, but don't come to us just accusing us that we're guilty because YouTube has tilted the, the floor in your favor. If you want to attack us, we'll fight back and we will prevail because we have 20 years of emails that no judge will take you seriously. Like just already yeah. we're like, look, like you, it's impossible. Like the judge will look <laughs> at this and like we would, you know, I don't want to, I know just enough law, but it's like whether you would get a motion for summary judgment or motion to dismiss, it would be hard for them ever with us anyway to say, um, these guys are infringing on our content because we have so much to demonstrate from them that they, they wanted this, they induced us. But anyway, the point was life is short, we moved on. And I think 2020 
would have been actually the year where we would have probably, uh, and I remain open to it, signing some kind of partnership with them. Then COVID hit and we moved on. And then what really happened was, you know, you, you kind of, when you manage an organization, so I also don't want to dwell too much on, on fair use, but, you know, we can talk about it as much as you want. But the point is, when, when you're in my shoes, you never want to be the guy that grows cynical. And then when you have young creatives come to you with ideas, shoot them down. You want to be the guy that supports them. So sure. we get a lot of interest for, for, for getting back into sports, getting back into music. So that's categories. We then also get formats, audio storytelling. You know, this is a very different experience. Uh, and I know you want to switch gears and we can soon to talk a bit about Eddie Van Halen and just the, the original list that we did and, and stuff like that. But the point is you do want to also let your creatives pursue things they're passionate about because if I can't give them an outlet to cover sports and music, they'll go elsewhere. And then third and, and fourth related, we obviously wanted to expand into podcasts. I used to do radio. I sent you an article that uh, this weekend to just give you a bit of background on, you know, my, my, you know, origins, you know, producing radio shows. Yes. But then finally, I think, yeah, like we, we do want to also serve fans, whether it's on iTunes, Spotify. And, and frankly, I, I don't even use the word podcast. It's you're, you're telling stories. You know, you're telling stories through your pen, you're telling stories through video, you're telling stories through words, verbal spoken words. And that's really what, what drives me. And as somebody that, you know, has with an amazing team built this huge company, relatively speaking, um, you want to spread your wings and challenge yourself. So I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's move into this new area. Well, that's some fascinating insight on the world of copyright. I mean, it's such a multi-layered world. There's so much going on in it. And it, I appreciate getting some clarity on both sides of it because it's true. There's two parties trying to run a business and make it, you know, mutually, maybe not mutually, but make it profitable for themselves. So it, it makes sense how it, how it may clash. Um, in terms of Eddie Van Halen, Watch Mojo has discussed him on quite a few lists. And I don't know if you wanted to go through all of these lists, but in terms of the top 10 guitarists of all time, Watch Mojo had him at number three. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on, on that ranking? Well, it's always hard to talk about the deceased than anything other than super flattering. And let's just say that Eddie Van Halen obviously could have been uh, number one on any other day. When we got into like clarity of, hey, our fans really like top tens and we really like top tens and we've done biographies of everybody. Like we've done the A list and B list. Now we're going down and doing like the D list artists. So once we narrowed down, um, as you could tell from just my background, I was always into sports and music. I was a big movie fan and, and whatnot, but it was kind of sports and music were two areas that I was really well versed in. And in sports, sorry, in music, you know, obviously we all go, I mean, I was born in 78. So at some point I'm sure I thought I would grow up and be Michael Jackson. But once I kind of like found my, my, my genre, I would say I was really gravitated towards hard rock and heavy metal. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you whether people believe me or not, that I personally um, was always more driven to build a system to be able to research information and then give audiences like a distilled curated right. intro or primer. So, you know, personally on that list, who, who are two and number one? Number one is Jimi Hendrix. And number two, I actually don't have in front of me at this moment, but um, Jimi Hendrix, I think was a pretty good pick in my, in my summation, but is he technically more gifted than Eddie Van Halen? I'm not sure. Exactly. So that's, that was my point. The thing, the reason why we had a lot of success was because one, people have always been drawn to lists, you know, Moses, but, but it's because even if you're not a fan of Beyonce, ergo, you may, if you're a fan, watch her biography, but if you're not a fan, you're probably not going to sit through a biography, but you will probably watch top 10 Beyonce songs the same way you may watch top 10 Garth Brooks songs and the same way you may watch top 10 Pantera songs because it's like a primer short and sweet. There's a yeah. known payoff. But once you decide to do it, when I started, I would joke that YouTube did not need two things. It did not need another vlogger who was like a talking head, just talking about stuff. And it didn't need multi-channel networks, right? So for me, it wasn't Ash's list. It wasn't mm -hmm. Ash Mojo, Watch Ash. It was Watch Mojo, I was building a system. So we wanted to balance objectivity and subjectivity. 
I personally, 10 years later, I could admit it. Obviously, I think Eddie Van Halen is, I mean, I'm not a guitarist. I'm more of like a biographer, researcher, you know, like writer. That, that's my mm -hmm. calling card in, in this. Why would you do music lists? But just hearing enough music, you could tell like Eddie Van Halen is probably better technically. You don't have to lift 300 pounds to know what's heavy. Exactly. There you go. Thank you. But, <laughs> but the point was, I was trying to, as the expression goes, not tell my team the time every day. I wanted to teach them how to build clocks. And mm. so when you look at top 10 guitarists, one is, do you do top 10 guitarists, solos, top 10 guitarists in a band? Very different. Do right. you do top 10 classically trained, top 10 shredders? So you kind of already have to decide, like, how granular do you want to get? And then you go with influential versus, and then you get into the, is it top 10 best, top 10 fastest, you know? So we always were like, we will never necessarily please everybody. Mm -hmm. I am quite sure that, for example, if you were to put Randy Rhodes above Eddie Van Halen, who are contemporary and very much seen as pairs, they both you know, kind of rose at the same time. Yeah. And also similarly, similar, like hard rock, heavy metal, you know, with a front man. And so it was like easy to compare. That is like a fair comparison. But I think for us on that list, you still want to go with like the iconic influential pioneers. And you know what, what we were trying to do in 2012 or 13, whenever that list came out was actually strive more for not just accuracy, but credibility Hmm. Um, and I felt like, you know, nobody's going to shoot us if we put Jimi Hendrix above Eddie Van Halen. But yeah. if you start a list and you put Jimi Hendrix at number 10, you could imagine some people are going to have a lot of questions when they go nine through one. So, totally. so that was important, you know, and I think the idea was, you know, I knew a lot about, I grew up listening to a ton of 80s hard rock and, you know, classic rock and, and heavy metal. And it was more that I could kind of like very quickly not just help produce these lists, but I could also kind of like sniff them and be like, does this pass the test? If somebody right. came today and were to do like the top 10 best, um, you know, funk bassists, okay, I mean, I kind of know that, but I wouldn't be able to just look at it and go, yeah, this is ready to be published. Right. But the first list, you know, I remember vividly, we did one on top 10 rappers, which was another genre I was in in the 90s quite a bit, and then went back and, and learned a lot about the, the, the origins. You know, I would see lists, and I would sometimes disagree with them, but it was almost really important for me to not make these ashes list. Right. And I would just challenge the researcher or the writer, and I would say, okay, take me through it. Like, why mm. are you saying that Jay-Z is in this rank? You know, I was like, why is Tupac, in your opinion, better than Biggie? You know, and I would kind of like test them because I just wanted us to build a system more than just, oh, it's my list. And frankly, the kind of culture that I wanted was more of a collaborative culture where it yeah. wasn't just the loudest voice, the strongest voice in the room to prevail. Because then, frankly, I figured, I feared it would always be my idea. Mm -hmm. you know? And I didn't want that. I by nature. Yeah, and I didn't want that. I wanted the best ideas to come up. So yes. I think that the, 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 the main takeaway was not so much like a given list, why is Eddie here or there? And I, I don't think going forward, that's really, I don't really think that like, you know, the whole building clocks here and then uh, you know, I will forever be out of your way and, and you know, you, you, you should do what, what makes sense to you to make this the best show ever. But I would say, I think the raison d'etre of that list to connect the, the dots with this podcast is that's a great question. You know, like when you look at the greatest, do you go for the pioneers, the influentials like Hendrix, or is it more, no, do you go for like the technical guys, whether it's Malmsteen mm -hmm. or, or Eddie Van Halen, or do you go for, you know, the slash you, who is like, you know, right. obviously very good at everything, but also super successful and sold. So, so I think that is really the banter part of, of what makes top 10 lists uh, so popular. Precisely. And I mean, people also get brought into it. And I like the comment about not wanting the strongest voice to prevail because the strongest voice is the channel. But what you guys always say is let us know in the comments, who would you have put? Would you revise this list? And, you know, also the topics are being taken from the viewers. And I think it's important to note everybody has their own list. Um, they can look at something as a primer, but the real beauty of it is to add their own opinions to it. And, you know, we look at the top 10 insane shred guitarists. Eddie Van Halen is number three. Yngwie Malmsteen is number one. Um, and we have, this one was curious to me, the top 10 iconic guitars of all time. 
Eddie Van Halen's Frankenstrat, of course, for anybody who doesn't know the name, the red, white, and the black, um, was number four under number one being Jimmy Page and number two being the Paul McCartney Hofner violin shaped bass, which I personally think Eddie Van Halen's might be more recognizable today. Yeah, you know what? It's very, it's very personal. And that is the two things you bring up. I really grew up, you know, the, the influences are not just the music I listen to. I've widely referenced, believe it or not, encyclopedias for their factual, historical, biographical nature. I've referenced working in convenience stores and reading magazines and then being in college and my older brother getting, you know, subscribing to magazines and reading that and really just absorbing so much info. But I think it is this element of nostalgia. You know what you mm -hmm. just said? That's what I wanted to stir up when I started Watch Mojo. And like really this phase, when we're talking about the lists and, and the iconic, it was to capture moments of people's youth. So things that they're not just passionate and fans of, but things that would take them back, the way we smell things and we just go mm -hmm. back. Same thing with music. That's the emotion I was, as a storyteller, wanted to draw. That you're going to think more maybe of, you said, Eddie Van Halen's guitar. Somebody else, I assure you, Obviously, I recognize Paul McCartney's violin, like, you know, shape guitar that I didn't grow up listening to Paul McCartney. So it doesn't resonate with me. Um, Randy Rhodes, V-shaped guitar, clear as the polka day. Dots. Yeah, polka. So, so I think what I always wanted, and I know I referenced the payoff of the top 10 list. The other thing that you alluded to is the fans being a part of it. You yeah. know, the fact that fa it's the American Idol effect. By the time Kelly Clarkson's album is out, she has a fan base, and that fan base helped her grow, find her voice. So what we would do is, you know, when, when, when I thought of the Suggest tool, again, in our evolution to manage this and always trying to serve fans but not pander to fans, I remember once I just, we had probably done a list that had either, um, you know, a, a reference to Queen, I suppose, and somebody said, oh, oh, it was summer. It was I remember it was summer because I left the office and it was nice and I was walking. And I remember reading a comment uh, just to see how the fans were reacting to a list that we had published. And I remember them saying, hey, November is the anniversary of Freddie Mercury's passing. Could you please do something? So mm -hmm. I was like, you know what's great idea, but it's really impossible to manage. So we built the suggest tool where people could go and suggest an idea and people would upload and download. But ultimately, when that idea, that suggestion would see the light of day and become a video, that was I feel a big part of our success as well because they yeah. helped that video come to life, you know, but it wasn't no so much that we could necessarily please everybody. There was no way that both Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes would be number one on the list, but how we would kind of explain the list, you know, the criteria we took, I always said we never took ourselves seriously, but we took our list super seriously and just mm. how we packaged it, how we brought it together. But in the end, you know, this was probably clear. It was always a means to an end. It was really more of like a, a way to give fans a little bit of like a history of their childhood. It was, it was for us to give them a little bit of escapism from whatever they were dealing with that day, whether it was mm -hmm. internal, like a fight with their spouse or like something that happens in the news. I could see that like, wow, on your bus ride home, you could just kind of like immerse yourself. And this was like, we start off in the mid-2000s, 2006, so about 2012. Yeah. Nobody was really doing what we were doing. 2012-13, when we really started to crank out and, and kind of like just crush it, so to speak, it was still not like you, you would go on YouTube if you, if you search for Metallica. You probably didn't have, especially Metallica hated Napster. You know, it wasn't like they were yeah. going to embrace YouTube. So when Watch Mojo kind of served up, you know, the, 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 the history of Metallica and the top 10 Metallica songs, I mean, to a fan, and I was thinking of a young Ash, you know, I remember like after right. school, I'd rush and before heading home, I'd go into the mall and I'd go read like Metal Edge and Hit Parader. And I would read all, it was like stale information of what Motley Crue did on tour two months ago. <laughs> but that was my connection to these bands because they would tour every couple of years, they'd roll into town. I was a fan of uh, Def Leppard growing up, so there that somebody would die or somebody would lose a limb, so they would have an album out <laughs> in five years. Not that I'm making light of that, but right. the point was, you know, my connection to Def Leppard was just the music I could listen and the magazines I would read. So, like, 20, 30 years later, when I started Watch Mojo, I was like, you know what? I want to produce something that gives that young person 
something that gets them connected to these artists that they love, but also helps them introduce them to uh, new bands. And I think mm -hmm. we, we did that. I think we maybe did it even a bit too well when, you know, we obviously had a lot of competition. And I think that's when the labels were like, well, wait, you know, like, let's go see if we could shake down Watch Mojo. And I think they were maybe surprised as to how well we understood the law and how much we were going to fight them. But then come to 2018, I was like, okay, we can move on and then we can come back to music when the timing is right. And I do think in many ways, the timing is right. And this initiative with the podcast also feels right. Yes, I completely agree, Ash. I think it's it's fantastic. And you know, I think that the expansion of the brand and, and adding more things for more people is simply going to hit those bases even stronger. Um, to end it off, I just want to bring this up because we're obviously of different generations. Um, but Eddie Van Halen seems to me at 22 years old, almost equally as relevant as he was all along. I mean, I was first exposed to Van Halen through hearing Hot for Teacher, um, then, you know, Running with the Devil, Jump, all the classics. And when he passed, I think the only one that was similar was Lemmy Kilmister because Lemmy Kilmister lasted a couple months, but this is the longest lasting rock and roll death I've ever experienced in my life. And I'm curious, why do you think that is? Why is this such a huge loss compared to maybe some of the other deaths? Not to devalue any other deaths, but this has lasted. Fair, fair point. I think, <clears throat> I think what the web ultimately has done is it's created a truly uh, deep experience, but also a very personal experience. What I mean by that is, you, based on your interest, can go down a rabbit hole and really learn, educate yourself, familiarize yourself with things in a way that was impossible for me. You know, I could maybe listen to the albums, read a couple of magazines. It was still very superficial. But now there's this deluge of content. So one, I think it is just like the magic of the web, so to speak. Two, I think the reality with Eddie Van Halen is, he really, really was somebody that crossed over. And that, that's maybe more of a reflection of Van Halen. I think Van Halen and Eddie were people who really expanded outside of just the genre that they were in. And partly because he did marry Valerie Bertinelli, who was an actress. So it was a bit of a bond to the mainstream. Um, right. So I think he maybe always had a little bit more, you know, like, relevance to a mainstream audience. But I would just challenge you and say that, you know, context is king. And I think what the web has done is it says, you could take a piece of content and where you put it and how that is consumed is going to take on a very different meaning for you than for somebody else, right? Hmm. So that's true. It's not that I disagree with you at all. But I think, though, that every time there is a passing, it's actually very quick if you think about it. By and mm -hmm. large, people, you know, it, it draws certain people's kind of attention, but then they move on to, to somebody else. But I think what you're nailing is that Eddie Van Halen was still at the beginning of a genre of music. You know, in many ways, you had like the 70s end where it was still driven a lot of classic rock, you know, not a coincidence, like, you know, with Led Zeppelin's history, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, you know, both coming out with the first albums in 69. And then they that, like they kind of owned that decade. Yeah. And then I, I think the 80s, you know, will always in this universe. I mean, obviously, there's another if you talk about pop and rap, but I think in like the kind of the rock music tree. I think Eddie Van Halen and Blizzard of Oz with Ozzy Osbourne, I think those albums were really the ones that defined what would go on to happen throughout the 80s. So the yeah. same way that Black Sabbath led the heavy metal tree and Led Zepp the classic, I think in many ways Ozzy Osbourne then went on to influence everything that came in hard rock to heavy metal. And Van Halen, in many ways, as much as they definitely had a hard rock sound, was not really heavy metal, apart from a couple songs here and there. Yeah. I feel they mainly influenced the hard rock and then kind of glam rock. And a lot of that had to do with the hair and, and all that. So not surprising that if you are a fan of Kiss, a fan of Ozzy and all that, 
I'm not surprising why Eddie Van Halen would be that person because he was also just like a always happy go lucky guy. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously he had his bouts with um, alcohol, you know, obviously was a chain smoker. I know he, you know, and I'm not one to question him after his passing. I know he said, well, I use the metal guitar pick, but I think generally doctors were like, clearly the, the, the smoking uh, is, is what led to his tongue cancer uh, at, at the end. But, yeah. you know, I think, I think Eddie was just like one of those guys that was very relatable. You know, he would smile when playing guitar. He did literally seem like a guy who could be your music teacher, so to speak. Right. So not surprising, but I think there's a lot of context there and perspective. You know, I think like for you, I, I don't doubt everything you say, but my my takeaway as a guy who ultimately you have a great team, but I'm kind of like, we always see people pass away and it's like, do we cover them or do we not? I, I kind of see how everybody because of the internet gets like the biggest funeral and ceremony. Right. Ever. You know, like when, when, when Black Panther passed away, you know, the outpouring of emotion almost seemed unparalleled. Totally. Uh, Eddie the same and many others this year, right? But I think that's that yeah. just... You know, it, it speaks to that nostalgia. It speaks to how that resonates with you. But it also speaks to the internet, where a topic that seems relatively niche, because you have a global fan base and global reach, actually seems like a tidal wave. And um, mm. yeah, and, and not surprising. And I think that is one challenge we've always had, which is, you know, on YouTube, audiences sometimes feel that when you uh, pay tribute to the deceased, you're kind of exploiting them, which is not really true. You're kind of paying right. an homage to them the way a magazine would do, you know, uh, a tribute to somebody when, when that celebrity would pass away. Exactly. And, and you know what, that, that makes a lot of sense to me because I wasn't around for John Lennon per se, or Dimebag or Randy Rhodes. And I can imagine that would probably have a similar, I mean, John Lennon, probably a bigger impact just because it's the Beatles. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that completely makes sense. It, it gives you easier access to what you're focused on. And you can maybe even think that the world is more focused on it than they actually are because it's in your face. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, when in 1991, when Steve Clark, guitarist for Def Leppard, passed away, he, yeah. you know, took a bunch of painkillers and his preferred drink, which was frozen vodka. He mm. took a nap and he didn't wake up, and he was young. He was like 31 or something, right? And I remember Jeez. how much that hit me. I came home and I turned on the radio, and they said Def Leppard guitarist Steve Clark passes away, and it just hits you. You know, I think it goes back to why we do and what we did from day one, which is I've always been drawn by biographies, telling the stories of success, telling the stories of, you know, obstacles, trying to overcome them, the, the, the kind of anxiety and drive and depression and ambition and addiction. Like I've always been really drawn to that because, you know, this year is a great example. We're, we're undergoing a pandemic I told my team, history books were going to write about us. But I go, history books don't just write about events. History books always talk about how people reacted to events. Yes. And I think, you know, we reacted really well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is one reason why I started doing this, because I wanted to write and profile people who were successful because they, did, they didn't start off being successful. You know, they started off having to overcome their demons, their doubts in order to kind of accomplish whatever they were driven by, whether it was fame, whether it was success, whether it was money, respect. I think ultimately everybody just wants to be fulfilled and everybody wants to leave a legacy greater than, you know, when they started their, their journey. I would completely agree. And I mean, I, I love in the article, um, one of the articles you've referred me to that I was reading talking about how nobody really joins Hollywood for the right reasons yet. Um, it's, it's really refreshing because sometimes you'll see people who appear to have, or, or may have better motives um, and Eddie Van Halen did have that smile and, and he was, like you mentioned, the first guy to be out there really smiling, playing guitar. I, I mean, other than Randy Rhodes. Um, and also I think when you touch on the mainstream appeal, you know, he did the stuff with Michael Jackson. Um, he was discovered by Gene Simmons. So he had that relationship. He pushed for jump to be put on an album for almost 10 years, you know? So I think you're right. Eddie really had it. A, a he was in tune with the mainstream and he wasn't off in the rock world. Um, some quick notes to add about Eddie Van Halen before we ended off. The cause of death for him was just re revealed actually yesterday as we were putting this episode together. Um, TMZ cites his immediate cause of death was a accident of, I guess, the big clinical word for a stroke. 
He has also had several underlying causes, including pneumonia, a bone marrow disorder, myelodysplastic syndrome, and lung cancer. So Eddie was a really yeah. sick guy. I think it's just a testament to show that he was smiling for the vast majority of his life. Every time we saw him out in the past five years, you know, at a Tool concert, somebody asked him to take a picture of him in front of the stage, and Eddie was smiling, took the picture of the guy. So just always a guy with a really good attitude. And I don't know about you, Ash, but that's how I'm going to remember him, just a positive inspiration. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there's a happiness that I sometimes, and I frankly noticed this after he passed where they said, you know, everybody else guitarists look like they're under so much pain and emotion. And frankly, internally, they probably are. Right. Um, but but Eddie Van Halen always smiled. And it's funny, when, when somebody said that recently and I was watching the Jump video, I was like, you know what? That's a good takeaway for you, Ash. Enjoy the journey, smile, um, because before you know it, it's all gone. Couldn't have said it better. Ash, thank you so much for joining me on episode one of the Inner Sleeve podcast. I think it's been fantastic. And for all the viewers, please make sure to, to subscribe here on Sound Mojo and, of course, all of the Watch Mojo social media platforms.